you, I'm going to let you, in your words, um, talk about what happened here because, as I understand it, uh, there was a union that was not very happy with you uh, for having received a, a charitable donation or a gift uh, from Jack Dorothy um, right after his uh, his retirement or, or immediately prior to his retirement, but somewhere thereabouts. Uh, it was, I believe it was like uh, 1.2 million uh, reals towards the renovation of sports facilities, um, which is a, uh, it, 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 it's uh, in a favela where, where he grew up. Um, so the, there, was a, there was an announcement that was made, um, and I guess there were people that were not happy about it, uh, members from the TSOL, which is the uh, Brazilian Socialism and Freedom Party. Uh, said that the idea of an American libertarian billionaire um, sponsoring somebody from a socialist party is troublesome, but then also that the funds are being spent at the discretion of that person and yourself, rather than uh, being essentially uh, you know put to the democratic process and asking people what it is that they need. That's, that's, that's as far as I understand it, but. I want you in your own words to relay sort of what happened so we can we can figure this one out. Yeah, so first of all, I found this controversy amazing. Like we had, we, I mean, you know, both my husband, who Dave Miranda, who's an elected member of Congress with the left-wing political party in Brazil, and I have obviously been around the world of politics for a good amount of time. We have seen a lot of things and, you know, I don't think we're particularly naive, but in our wildest dreams, we never imagined this would ever be a controversy, let alone a way for people to attack us. So let me just lay out what happened. Um, on May 6th of this year, the police, the Rio police, entered the favela of Jacare Zinho, which is one of the largest favelas. Favela is essentially a slum. It's like a lawless slum. It's when poor people who have no property build on land that doesn't technically belong to them. But millions and millions of people in Brazil, especially in Rio de Janeiro, live in communities like this. Um, for a long time, they were completely lawless. The city never entered them, except when the police would occasionally go in and shoot around and kill a bunch of people. On May 6th, the police did exactly that. They went into the act of the Zinho um, with a huge battalion. Their argument was they had a arrest warrant for something like three dozen uh, alleged members of drug gangs who they said they had to arrest because they were recruiting young kids into these drug gangs as young as 10, 11, and 12. They went in, they do what they always did, what they did what they always do, which is they shot indiscriminately. They ended up killing 28 people, 28 people just killed them um, in summary execution style. And then they left. The next day, my husband, who grew up in Jacarezinho, that's where he's from, that's where his family still lives. He, his mother died when he was five. The woman who kind of took him in, who became a surrogate mother, she refuses to move out. It's the only community she knows. So she's there. Her children are there who are my husband's siblings, all of David's childhood friends. Obviously, he feels a strong affinity there. So he went to Jack and Azinu to talk to the community leaders. And what they all told him was, the problem is we have no public spaces. So when kids get home from school... There's nowhere for them to go. The football fields, or soccer rather, which is a religion in Brazil, are completely dilapidated. The centers that were supposed to be for dance and for music and for theater are all completely destroyed. There's no broadband. There's no internet access. If we could find a way to build structures that would give kids the ability after school, instead of going out onto the street and being lured by drug gangs, to go study English or figure out how to put on plays or just congregate and play sports, tennis, ping pong, you know, soccer, develop their talents and skills, we could improve the lives of 10,000, 20,000 people. We all met the day after these community leaders that David knows, David, myself. And obviously the big question was funding. Like this Bolsonaro government has no interest in funding stuff like this. The state and city of Rio de Janeiro are basically bankrupt, so they can't even pay their employees, like municipal employees, all the time. All the time, you know, most of the time, much less fund brand new structures and 
you know, renovation and construction in the favelas, which they don't really care about. And David has been able to direct some funding with the status of the congressman, but nowhere near enough. So I said to them, put together, you know, a design, meet with all of the members of the community and just kind of make it your dream proposal. Don't think about cost. Just put in like, what is, if we could have an unlimited budget, what is our, our dream vision for what we could do for Jack and Zinio after this massacre? They worked with David. They put together a proposal for the construction of new buildings, for the renovation of others. The price tag was 1250000 reais, um, which given the strength of the dollar is only about $250,000. So this has been something that I've been doing for a long time, which is going to philanthropists, billionaires and the like and in the United States and saying, given how strong the dollar is, you can make a huge, much bigger impact in Brazil with your money than you can in the U.S. because $200,000 in the U.S. gives this limited potential, but it turns into 1,250,000 reais, which means we can do a lot. Jack Dorsey was the first person on my mind because he has previously funded charity projects in Rio. He met with this kid who uh, is from one of the other favelas, uh, Alamal. He founded a little newsletter to cover uh, the favela life when he was 11 years old and it's turned into like a real uh, media outlet and they also do things like distribute food baskets jack gave them a million dollars obviously no strings attached they came with to him with a proposal his foundation gave a million dollars they took it they handed out food baskets in 25 different favelas for i think something like three months um he's met with them before he's met with community activists before so I went to Jack, I said, here's a proposal. This is what happened with the police massacre. However much you would be willing to you know, fund, I'd be really grateful. We can figure out what the priorities are. He looked at it, he got back to me, he said, I'd like to fund the whole thing. The way it works is there are no strings attached. We created a nonprofit in Brazil. The directors are the people who are the community activists in Jack and Azinho. Jack donates the money through his foundation to this nonprofit in Brazil. That money is then administered in accordance to the plans that they developed that he had no say in. He has no further role of any kind in the development. Um, and that was it. And we went on to a podcast about a week and a half ago that's Brazil's largest podcast, kind of like the Joe Rogan of Brazil. And David talked about his frustration in not being able to get funding for these communities and said, so we finally decided that we were going to start to use other means, including charitable foundations, to build structures, not just in Jack and Azinha, but our plan now is to do it in several other favelas in Rio de Janeiro. And he was obviously proud that he was able to do this for his community and thrilled, as are the community activists, that construction is now going to start within the next week. And I should say, the other part of the plan was... We're only going to employ residents of Jack and Azinho. That's going to be who does all the building, who does all the construction. The architects are going to be from Jack and Azinho, except in one or two rare cases when we might need some specialists who keep, we can't find. But by and large, it's also going to be a way to give create jobs inside Jack and Azinho as well as create these structures. Within, I would say, I don't know, four or five days of our appearance on this on the show, a leftist writer from some magazine took that clip put it on twitter and said this is extremely worrying that a left-wing congressman is having his career financed by an american libertarian billionaire mm -hmm. obviously that was a lie none of the money is going to david nor to his campaign you can't take foreign donations it's all going to this nonprofit that is going to oversee the project it's only going to fund the construction of of this project from there, it just went wild. Um, all kinds of crazy claims that Jack Dorsey was trying to invest in Jack and Azinho. I don't know how a, someone who's worth $6 billion would try and make themselves richer by exploiting, quote unquote, the resources of a favela that has no resources. But that was the claim was it was pretend charity and that this was really about just enriching Jack Dorsey. And from there, you know, there was some unverified 
Twitter account that was arguing with me and attacked me. Apparently, it turned out to be a Twitter account associated with one of the unions with a uh, oil worker or oil rig union that can go yeah, here. Yeah, the, uh, the, the oil workers of Espirito uh, Santo. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They weren't verified. I had no idea who I was arguing with. But what they were arguing, you know, I was saying, how can you look? How can you possibly be against? The, this this project that is going to help the lives of so many people, like the people who are absolutely most in need. Like, if you're angry about the funding, what is your alternative? Help me get the funding that you think is more acceptable, and I will go and work with you in order to do that. None of them had any alternatives, obviously, to get that funding. Their argument was this was a neoliberal solution, that the state should do this. You know what? They're absolutely right. The state should do it. And maybe one day, like in 20 or 30 years, there will be a really good socialist government. If Lula wins, it's not going to be that. Lula is not a socialist. He ran Brazil for eight years and worked very well with capitalists and oligarchs, in part because he had to and in part because that's who he is. But maybe one day in you know 20 or 30 years, the perfect socialist co- government will arrive. But I don't really feel it's moral to tell people who are suffering now, whose children have no future— Look, I would love to be able to help you, but unfortunately, the only way I can get the funding is through an ideologically uh, an ideologically impure way. If you, you're going to have to just wait twenty or thirty years, and socialism is coming, so I don't think anyone okay. who's against this project, I need not only to yeah. hear the critique, which I already understand that it's bad that we have to go to billionaires to get this funding. That's obvious. I already know that. I, I want to hear the alternative. I don't think that. I want to hear the alternative. Of how to I don't help think it's necessarily people. that I don't think it's necessarily that you went to a billionaire to ask for support uh, to you know to, uh, to develop recreational facilities in in a low income neighborhood. I don't think that that's the problem. Like I went through. Is that a problem? Is that a good or a bad thing to do? It's, it's, it's neither. It's, it's a thing. Like I don't, I don't see it as good or bad. It can it can have good uh, outcomes. It can have bad outcomes. I think probably where what ba- what bad outcomes could it have? Okay, to give an example, so the neighborhood where I grew up in Rexdale, Ontario, um, that had it, uh, it had city councilors that were deliberately underfunding local recreation for years and ended up with a city councilor that uh, declared a war on, like, libraries, like public services like libraries. So when a, uh, if a private organization wants to donate funds to help, I don't know, keep libraries open or wants to make a donation towards um, opening recreational facilities, that can be seen as a good thing if you are in a state of deprivation. It's also a bad thing because if the purpose of private companies and uh, benevolent individuals, if their if their role ends up becoming to backstop the shortcomings of government, then government has every incentive to simply not fund projects and allow on the or, or rely on the open handedness of the British people that are donating to, probably to their very campaign or at least exist within the class whose interests are best served by depriving people of, uh, of public services, well, we're going to depend on them to backstop it. Andre, Hold Andre, these favel- these, these favel- the deprivation in these okay. favelas are going on for generations. I get it. I, generations of kids yeah. whose futures are destroyed. I so, so there okay, is but, no government who's ready to step in. They, there okay. is no good. That's not going to happen whether we do the project or not. There's no government stepping in to help these people. I'm just giving you the you said, how could this be a bad thing? And you, you said, how can it be a good thing? How can it be a bad thing? Well, good is obviously what you thought. I'm saying to you, OK, well, here's the downside of that. Right. Is that once once you once you do that, once you uh, push people to rely on the open handedness of the rich, well, then the open handedness of the rich is all that they can expect whenever it does show up. There's no obligation for that to happen. But I think. Another problem, I mean, I, I, I went... But, but, but before you go on sure, to that sure. next argument, and I, and I want to hear the next point, but let me just, just one last yeah. question about this. At the end of the day, like, shouldn't it be the people in those communities who make that decision? You know, one of the things that David told me as somebody that who was has actually, actually experienced, who was actually, like, in his adolescence, dug through garbage cans to find food, one of the things he told me which I absolutely believe is that when you are denied basic necessities of life, I don't mean like luxury items that you wish you had. I mean like food and basic services. You don't give the slightest shit where it comes from or who gives it to you or what their motive is. All you care is that you get it. I get that. I get that. 
I get that. So that was actually going to be my next question was, did you and David go to people in the community and say, hey, listen, so we've gotten, and, and I saw a lot of people saying that it was $1.2 million that Jack Dorsey gave you and David. It wasn't, it was $1.2 million to the L, which is something like a quarter of a million dollars. Right, I mean, right. I mean, and he didn't not, give it to us. Gonna, he didn't. He didn't give it to us. He gave it to this nonprofit. It being administered by the people who are in the community. And that's what I was. That's what I was just getting at. Is uh, you know, to a lot of people, it came across as, a, as though he's giving the uh, the money to you, or giving the money to you in trust. And I was going to ask you, okay, so what what uh, role did the people in that neighborhood have, both with the you know, the the, uh, the return of that money? And what role are they going to have in how the money is spent, right? Because it, it seems as though recreation is exactly where it's going to go. But how much say did the people have in that? They did. The, 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 the leaders of the community, kind of the community activists, are the ones who did the plan. Like, obviously, I don't know where in Jack and Azinu it would be best to put a new football field or where to build a new structure that would be most centralized to ensure the greatest access for kids who live there. The, the people who are the community activists, the people who, you know, speak for those residents who go and try and get more funding for their communities, the recognized community leaders are the ones who drew up those designs working with David, who's also from the community, whose family lives in that community. And the design came from them. This, like I said, I said, make your wish list. Like, what is it that if you had all the funding that you needed, what would this renovation project be? And they came back and they said, here's the plans. Here, I didn't create the plans. Jack Dorsey did create the plans. They created the plans for what they wanted. My only role was, besides encouraging them to do that, to then go and get the funding. Okay, so so there's nothing that, that uh, passes through any sort of, organization that yourself or David have set up. You're saying that this is David uh, using, uh, David and yourself using your connection, Jack, to appeal on behalf of people in this neighborhood to be able to get funding that they can build sports facilities, cultural centers, et cetera. You know, in, in uh, Jack Rosinio, yeah, I mean, Miguel, we're, and so on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're going to set, we're going to, we're going to set up some kind of like financial oversight to ensure that, you know, the money's being administered in accordance with the plans. But the people who are going to be administering the project are going to be exclusively... When you say we, though, like, who's who's we? Like, you and David, or...? Yeah, we're going to we're gonna pick somebody who, you know, sits on the board to make sure that the money is being administered because that is our responsibility for having gotten the money. But the, the decisions of how the project is going to proceed are completely going to be done by the board and composed exclusively of... Residents of Jacarezinho. Okay, I, I I can I can understand that, and I think a couple of things happen here. One is the uh, the difficulty in language, right? Like, I I can't rely on a translation that's automatically like easily done by Twitter to figure out whether this this is the correct context or not. And watching the uh, the clip that David posted of the uh, the radio show where it was announced. Uh, I, I had to go and get a Portuguese speaker to make sure that I was getting the gist of this the correct way. Do I think that um, do I think that this is a problem? I, only to the extent that we have, I mean, we have similar issues happen, you know, right up here in in Toronto, where uh, rich donors will find a community project that they believe is worthwhile and put money towards that, and also have. Uh, members or a single individual overseeing how money is spent, but it, it has to fit a certain set of parameters in order for the money to be considered well spent. And the problem with that is that it culturally stifles those same communities and neighborhoods that they think that they're uplifting. What it does is create a, a class of people that aspire to be in the good graces of these, uh, you know, petty bourgeois people or these billionaires or politicians and so on. And then they end up designating themselves sort of like the captains of their community. And then their voices end up speaking over everybody else. So while they may themselves be mishandling funds, they may be in conflict with the community as to how money is spent and so on, that can create a whole set of problems. So I can see where people have an issue with this. 
at the same time, like it's also fairly common that some rich asshole will donate a couple of hundred thousand dollars to a community project that's administered. Maybe the basketball court gets built. Maybe there's like a local, you know, theater or art center that gets built out of that. And then they move on with their lives. One of the, okay, it's, uh, one, one similar example is that at the Dixon Towers, which is a, uh, uh, a set of like condominiums that were built way back in like the 70s. Uh, that happened to be where many uh, Somali immigrants and uh, East African immigrants, when they came to Canada in the 1990s, many of them happened to uh, purchase in that block of tower. And there was no local recreation center. There was basically nothing for the kids around the neighborhood to do. And they were also often harassed by police. They were often like picked up, rest, beaten sometimes. Uh, there was local crime that was happening around the neighborhood. So the Toronto Raptors, uh, led by Vince Carter, um, went out to the community and uh, built the basketball court. So they funded the basketball court. They brought the news out. You know, they filmed the kids like playing basketball. They had themselves like a nice picnic outside. It was a great photo opportunity. And then after that, nothing happened. Like there was just, there was nothing that was invested in that neighborhood ever since. The only government intervention into that community has been police vehicles squat vehicles. I've literally been inside the apartment of a woman in her 80s that she told me a scorch mark on her floor from where police kicked in the door and threw a flashbang grenade in there uh, looking for a suspect that hadn't lived in that apartment for years or in that, in that condo for years. So meanwhile, this like woman in her 80s uh, was declining in terms of health because he was like thrown back to her uh, time as a refugee uh, fleeing the violence in Somalia, uh, it, it actually left her with, with PTSD. That is the only government intervention that's, that's been ha- happening in the community, is, is, is police intervention and nothing since. So I think that because that's a fairly common story, it's a very easy track for people to fall back on and say, well, this is what happens when the rich make a photo opportunity out of being open-handed to the poor. And I can see exactly where that critique comes from. So I'm not saying... It's always a bad thing, but I'm saying right. I mean, but, but, but again, I mean, I, again, I mean, I, I think like I, I mean, I think that any minimal humility means that you defer to the people in the community about whether or not they want this. So if if Jack Dorsey and I had shown up on the border of Jack and Zinu and said, "Hey, residents, listen up, we're about to do this incredible gift for you. We're going to bestow this wonderful." That's not what happened. They came to us saying, "This is what they wanted to build." And I'm not going to tell them no under any circumstances if I can help them. The other issue is, you know, it's, it's such an interesting dynamic on the left. Um, you know, it, this became an issue both on the Brazilian left and the American left. So the Brazilian left are all gearing up to vote for Lula in 2022. Obviously, they have always voted for Lula. Lula's party, the Workers' Party, is itself funded by billionaires and always has been. They take, they're like the Democratic Party. They take enormous donations from all of the biggest corporations from the heirs of those corporations. And if you ask Gula, why is it as a socialist that you're taking money from billionaires and from gigantic corporations? He'll say, because I want to win the election, because if I don't win the election, I can't do anything. The reason Gula can run next year, the reason he's eligible to run in 2022, unlike in 2018, when he was deemed ineligible to run is because a media outlet called The Intercept Brazil did the reporting that proved that his convictions were corruptly and unjustly obtained. And the evidence that we were able to present, which the Bolsonaro government attempted to imprison me for revealing, is what has enabled him to run. And the entire Brazilian left was cheering The Intercept Brazil for the last two years, even though it's funded entirely by a billionaire. There's NGOs all over the American left, including media outlets and people who work for NGOs for racial equality and environmental justice and all kinds of other things. We are currently on a platform created by somebody who's either a billionaire or close to it. We're working on Rumble, which was just invested in by Peter Thiel. We use Twitter, which is run by Jack Dorsey. So I always find it a little difficult to understand when these kind of standards of purity get applied and when pragmatism becomes justifiable. I wish we didn't live in a world 
where the people of Jakarta Azizu needed to rely on the kindness of billionaires in order to build structures, basic social structures that will give their kids a, a fighting chance to have a decent future. But that is the world we live in. And maybe the day will come when we don't. But I don't think you can tell people that they need to wait for that day. And I feel like that was the argument that, being I also made. don't think I, I think that's mis- I think that's misrepresenting what it is that people were saying to you. I think people what, were what asking were you saying? questions. What, I still, what is the objection? I still don't understand it. Okay, so so I mean, granted, there were like bad faith people who were just like, oh, you know, that's that's what you do is you go around, you know, taking money from billionaires for your personal pet projects, right? But there was that. But then I also did see people asking you questions about, okay, so what what relationship do people in the community have? with this funding, where, where were their voices in this conversation? And I think the, uh, the uh, Petro Workers Union, uh, when they were having that conversation with you, were, I think they were fair. I, I, I think that they were, uh, they were unyielding, maybe a little bit, uh, maybe didn't give you the benefit of the doubt. But I also don't think that they were being unfair in the kinds of questions that they were asking you. And I think what kind of and you have a tendency to do this. And you, you, you know, like we've talked about this often. And I have the same problem too. Like I'll, I, I'll lose patience with people and just like basically tell them to fuck off. But when you say that the people who have a problem with this are privileged leftists, and you're talking to, you're talking to a petrol workers union, you understand how like writing your, your critics off as being privileged people that are making a big think about nothing. Like you get how that kind of, turns you into the, like, it turns you into the main character. It was like, there's nothing wrong that you can do and anybody who's criticizing you is it somebody who's, who's operating from a place of privilege that doesn't know, like, the real, real of what's going yeah, on. Yeah, but, 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 but this is, this is, well, this is a really interesting part of this whole conversation. So, you know, like I said, this project has the potential to help the lives of tens of thousands of people, like, for real. Like, these kids are going to get to go. And it's not just, like, playing, like, a few little bit of soccer. It's, like, educational facilities to pay for English classes so that, like, there are... No, I got that. Okay. You, also, you also have to get that when you, say that when you say things like, you know, these children have no future. And I, I understand. Like, I, I, I haven't grown up in conditions as bleak as, you know, growing up in a uh, resilient favela by, by far. But I would, I would venture to argue that, you know, many relatives of mine did come from very poor circumstances as well. And when they've had projects bestowed upon them by rich people, there have been positive outcomes. There have been severely negative outcomes. For example, my family is from Jamaica, which has effectively been converted into a tourist mono economy. My stepfather is a precious metals mining engineer who's been helping me understand uh, how these uh, mining projects done by, especially by Canadian companies all over the world, are actually violating human rights. But uh, he grew up in a, a house, like a tin roof house in Kingston, Jamaica, that is smaller than the office that I'm doing this podcast at. And he will, he will tell me that there are people that have worked to the detriment of Jamaica that are celebrated as national heroes. One of them actually just passed away, the founder of the Sandwich Company, uh, who was seen by many as, you know, being the, uh, the, the benevolent billionaire who, you know, employed Jamaicans, uh, founded the Jamaica Observer, which is a, uh, a daily uh, paper in Jamaica, donated to community projects and so on. But there are also many more people who would say that he's had an incredibly detrimental effect on the Jamaican economy, which is essentially has stifled it, uh, stifled any potential new growth and turned it into a tourist sex den. So I, you, you got to understand that it's not just coming from people who don't understand the conditions of people that grew up in neighborhoods like David grew up in, it's also coming from people who did grow up in similar conditions and have, I think, reasonable critique. Yeah, look, I mean, um, I'll tell you my own experience that shapes a lot of what I, what I think about this, which is my own experience of my own kids who we adopted from, they came from a shelter, an incredibly impoverished shelter in the most impoverished part of Brazil, which is northeastern Brazil. When they came here, when we first met them, it was obviously obvious that they were very smart kids just very like connected very aware very like curious but they were 10 and 8 when we adopted them and it was shocking the things they didn't know like they didn't know the days of the week they couldn't do anything with numbers i mean like even simple math they didn't know what birthday what their birthdays were um they they 
barely were functional. And the reason was not because they're not smart. They're very smart. It was because they never had any social structure that allowed them to develop their potential and their intellect and learn anything. And had they stayed in that shelter, just like most of the kids who exit those shelters, they almost certainly would have been unemployable and probably like functionally illiterate. Four years later, just four years with us, having the structure that kids need, going to good schools, they now, you know, equal, if not sometimes excel in school performance with all the kids who have been having in that the enjoyment of that structure from birth. And so I look at my two kids and I think about how many millions of other kids with their potential, with their talent, with their energy, with their potential are being suffocated and crushed because they don't have the basic structures in life. That is a huge factor in the outcome of kids. And I think that like, you know, you talk about Twitter um, and like what it can do and you're right, like in the heat of Twitter, we all say things that like aren't probably you know, the best way to make the case, which is one of the reasons why we're here and using other platforms so we can escape from that. But it works the other way too. Yeah, log, log off, Gwen. Yeah, log off. like a log off, go touch grass. Like, but the, the, the reason, let me just say this, Andre, the reason that you know about that discussion I had with the, this, I don't even, I still, I guess they're like some social media person of some union. Like I said, they weren't verified. It's unclear to me to this day who the, who it was who I was talking to. I don't think anybody knows. But there's a far left website that deals in conspiracy theories that looked at this entire set of events, looked at what happened in Jack or Dezinho, the fact that we have personal connections to Jack or Dezinho, that my in-laws live in Jack or Dezinho, that there's this opportunity that came from the community that we help them make possible. They looked at all of that. And what they did was they wrote an English article and then tweeted out the fact that one of the people who I had been arguing with happened to be a, a labor union. Like they put out the worst possible part of this entire transaction, ignored the rest of it in order to get clicks by attacking me and making it seem like I was disparaging a union. And the argument that I was making to both the union and to other people was not that they themselves are privileged. I obviously don't know the background of the people with whom I'm speaking on Twitter who are anonymous and from unverified accounts, the argument that I was making was the framework that they were advocating for, which is that you shouldn't use private charity or the money of billionaires in order to help people's lives. You should wait until society has an ideological and fundamental change in it so that you don't have to rely on billionaires, but instead the state will do it. That is a privileged mindset. That is the mindset that says, you tell people who are starving, you're not going to breach into your own pocket and buy food for them because that's a neoliberal solution someday soon, maybe a year from now, maybe 10 years from now, maybe 20 years from now, there will be a program that eliminates hunger and that ensures that everybody has a meal and they won't have to rely on solutions like that any longer. That's the kind of thing that you say when you're not hungry that night. And the people we were talking to are the people who live with the people who are hungry whose kids have nowhere to go. And those people don't care about the ideolog ideological framework of what can be done to help them. They only care about the help that can arrive as quickly as possible. And those are the people that we decided to listen to. Well, sure. It's just when you say things like, uh, you know, this is a conversation that's being had among the others. Privilege. I mean, what, what, is, what is the, uh, the mining salary in Brazil look like? I've seen as low as like 2,800 ray up monthly. I, I mean, Andre, uh, I mean, again, like you don't know, like the way it was purposely depicted by this far left site that's insane. It's kind of like a complete conspiracy site, Brazil Wire. They they lie all the time. The, the, the way they framed it was Jack Dorsey was making an investment in Jack Adesino as though he had purchased, you know, Fabella houses that he intended sure. to profit from and sell. The entire thing they did was based on a complete lie. You don't, you don't have to tell. You don't have to tell me. I I have been smeared as a uh, supporter of Goldman Sachs giving money to PFL because I had the nerve to look through an accusation that Goldman Sachs was funding uh, the Party for Social Movement and Liberation, and found out through the tax documents that were being posted that actually it's somebody it's a it's a person who had or has a Goldman Sachs charitable trust account that was holding money in trust for the people's form 
had nothing to do with PSL whatsoever, except for the fact that members of PSL have been on the executive of the people forum. So I get how like people can take a thing, a thing that happened, flatten all nuance out of it and make you seem like a complete demon because you have had connection to billionaires in some way, shape or form. I'm not, I'm not denying that. I, I guess what I am saying is that like, I think a lot of it can be mitigated. Like, listening to you talk about this, I'm like, okay, but this, Sounds like any regular regular old community project where somebody rich wants to do something good for people in a particularly disadvantaged or non privileged neighborhood. It's like here, you know, here here you go, here's whatever it is that you need. Uh, go ahead and, and build your dream project. Like I completely understand that, and that is fairly common, like not just along like NGOs, but across communities. It happens all the time. But I, I think that there is a substantive critique to be made about the the prevalence of that happening. And I think the way to deal with that isn't just to write people off and, and be defensive and say, well, you know, what, what better ideas do you have? Or is it, just, is it bad to take billionaire money? I think it's, it's probably bad, especially if you're dealing with people on Brazilian, Brazilian left. I mean, I, I, know that, I know that you're now a naturalized citizen, but that you're, you're, you still have moved to their country. You're, you're also somebody who, in terms of privilege, I mean, you live on a fairly expensive property um, with your beautiful family. I mean... You can't really talk about privilege in that in that form without acknowledging that you also have many privileges. A lot of people don't of have course, access. Of course, of course, no, absolutely. A lot of people and don't have that kind of access. So you can't just write people off as privilege no, and say, "Well, it, people who are criticizing no, you are doing something." No, you're that totally. And look, like anytime you do anything that affects the public, anytime you do anything that affects the public, you have the obligation to answer questions. There absolutely should be questions about, like, wait a minute. How is this working? What role does Jack Dorsey have? What role do you have? Did this, this come from you or did this come from like the citizens of Jack Dorsey? You? People who were asking me those questions, I was more than happy to engage in the, the, the dialogue with. What happened is by the time it got to the American left, like, you know, people on the majority report, like I bet you Sam Cedar couldn't fucking find Brazil on a map let alone, like, have given the slightest thought in oh, his life. Oh, majority report talked about it, too? Uh, about, like, uh, uh, I bet, like, get, let alone given the slightest thought in his life about the people in Rio, uh, Rio de Janeiro favelas. They did an entire segment, not about the fact that we were working on this project, not with questions about this project, but based on this thing that they had picked up on the internet from a source that they didn't know, that I had called someone from a union as though I was talking to, like, a rig worker, privileged. That was the only part of it that they cared about was trying to take this tiny little thing out. Yeah, and that's I, I when I, that. you know, I, I will, I will say, he, I will, I, I have, I have my doubts that Sam Peter had somebody translate that conversation from Portuguese to English to make sure that like, well, like I said, it was, it, it was this bullshit English site called Brazil wire. That's just like a conspiracy thing. Right. They make shit up all the time. That's where they got it from. It was in English, but you're right. They had no idea what Jack and Azina was. They ne never heard of it before. They had no interest in any of that. Except in this. So people were asking questions in good faith. I was more than happy to engage. And, you know, for all the talk about you arguing with people on Twitter, me arguing with people on Twitter, in part, it does come out of the sentiment that I do think that if you're a public figure, if you're trying to enter a public conversation, if you're trying to have an effect on public life, you do have an obligation to answer questions, not just from blue checkmark famous people, but from people in the public as well. And part of, you know, I think what we decided to do here, and unfortunately we've been going for an hour and a half, so I do need to end, but in general, the idea is we're going to be taking questions. We're going to take, we're going to take questions. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I, I, yeah, I do want to take some questions, but I also wanted to, to hash that out with you because, yeah, I mean, you know, you know how I am already. Like, I'm not just going to uh, pay attention to whatever the discourse is of the day and let that be, oh God, there's not the discourse that I have to bring up with you, but we'll save that for next week. But I'm not just going to pay attention to whatever the discourse is of the day and make up my mind from that. I'd like to take the time to figure out what was actually said between people and, and then figure out what it is that there is to talk about or what substantive issues there are to, to discuss. I, I think a lot of it was overblown, but I also think that there, there was dismissiveness on your part that added fuel to the fire where they didn't have to. Yeah, I mean, look, that may be, again, Twitter in general fosters that. I can tell you that you know, I knew some of the people who had initiated the criticisms, and these are people who, you know, are in different political camps than David, who clearly were motivated by by 
particular animus or by political rivalries yeah. and not by any legitimate concerns. The people who did have legitimate con- questions, I tried to answer them as best I could. I made clear when people were lying that Jack Dorsey was administering the project, that he was investing in buildings or in construction. And that narrative continued to take off anyway. So I think a lot of it was driven by bad faith. And like at the end of the day, you know, I guess with all the things that people do in the world and all the things that are being done in the world, a project that is designed to help the people in the greatest need that takes up my time and my energy that takes up, you know, other people's time and energy to no benefit to ourselves is something that, you know, people should look at as something positive, even if there are questions and concerns about how it fits into the broader ideological framework. I have no problem with that. Um, what I what I did get irritated by was it was clearly an attempt to demonize um, a project that even if you have doubts and questions and concerns, clearly has benevolent intent behind it and you know i think it's pretty ugly to do that especially if you're not somebody who's ever engaged in efforts to help those people who you've decided you know you want to kind of shit on the project that's designed to help them and that came from them in the first place well i mean you're you're never going to be able to answer the questions as to whether the intentions whether the benevolent intentions of the project match the outcomes you won't be able to answer that question for three and four and five years from now so I think probably what's the best thing for you to do is to report back in three and four and five years and, and let people know where where the project at, who's benefited from it, and what people in the community say about it. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, for me, the thing that for the moment is decisive is the wishes of the people who live there and not theorists who are, you know, looking at it through an ideological framework or through some dogma who are outside of Jack Dezino deciding how best to help the people there. I think the people there have, in the first instance, the right to have their preferences deferred.